Hello, um, good evening, and uh, welcome to the extension of your day for this rather special occasion. Uh, we're here to um, mark the publication of Susan Rowland, Dr. Susan Rowland, my, my colleague, uh, her latest book, Jungian Literary Criticism, a very uh, handsome cover it has too, I'm sure you'll agree. And it seems to me that not a year goes by that Susan doesn't publish uh, uh, <laughs> another book. <laughs> so I'm uh, green with envy at her um, productivity. And let me tell you that you know, it's no mean feat to do that. It takes um, not only a, a, a constant source of inspiration, but the, uh, the diligence and the commitment to devote oneself to, to writing in that way. And alongside all the other things that Susan does here at Pacifica, um, this is a, a, an achievement to be applauded. So um, I think we all know Susan here, but um, we're going to be uh, reaching a, a wider audience, uh, we hope. So let me, by way of introduction, read um, Susan's um, biography, a brief, very brief version that's included in the book. So Susan Rowland, PhD, is chair of MA Engaged Humanities at Pacifica Graduate Institute, California. That's where we are right now. And she teaches on the doctoral program in Jungian psychology and archetypal studies. Um, I myself am chair of that program. Um, she is author of nine books, nine books on C.G. Jung, including Remembering Dionysus and Psyche and the Arts, both published also by Routledge. She is the founding chair of the International Association for Jungian Studies, IAJS, and Susan also writes detective fiction. So not only is she a theorist of uh, literature um, from the perspective of Jungian psychology, she's also a practitioner uh, of writing not only detective fiction, but also, uh, I happen to know, poetry. And she's skilled uh, equally, I think, at both. So she's informed not only by a theoretical understanding of the field, but by our own creative practice. And if I may say so, Susan, that your style has a, a certain literary charm, um, which is not always the case in academic writing. And as Susan would be herself far too modest to sing the praises of this book, so I'm going to do it for her. Um, and I'll do it with the help of, of three, um, what I think we can say are glowing endorsements that are included here on the on the front cover of the book. The first one is from Leslie Gardner, who um, is a fellow in, at Essex University uh, in the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies. So this is Led Leslie's assessment of Susan's book. A forerunner of Jungian literary criticism, Susan Rowland has now provided here an updated volume of ambition and character with rigorous and brilliant attention to individual pieces of writing. She challenges the very necessity and notion of a Jungian approach to study in literature and responds to that query with thoughtful but sweeping notice of commentary over centuries. This volume functions as an introduction for a new reader of the application of Jung's literary analysis and offers controversial perspectives on traditional readings for more experienced readers highly recommendable for its clarity and scope. Now, it's, it's no uh, easy thing to write in a way that is both complex enough to deal with controversy uh, and complex topics in the field, and at the same time, make your work accessible to a newcomer to the field. So uh, I look forward to spending more time with this book. I've read much of it already, and it's, I think, distinguished by its lucidity. And one, one element that particularly appeals to me, as it may to you, is that Susan's included in each section a summary in three sentences. So not only is this a wide-ranging and complex book, but she has the ability to synthesize and write in, in a concise way that uh, illuminates the topic under consideration. 
Many of you, perhaps all of you, are students here, and you will appreciate just how difficult it is to do that. So um, let me embarrass Susan a little more by reading a couple, couple of other endorsements. This is Dr. Luke Hockley, uh, the University of Bedfordshire in the UK. This book teaches all of us to read again. This book teaches all of us to read again. Through a Jungian lens, Susan Rowland guides us through a familiar literary landscape and shows us how to see it as if for the first time. In an, art, in an act of alchemy, her insights transform our understanding of literary relationships in the books themselves. Her expert advice also shows us how to experience the joy of reading as we rediscover the page-turning magic of make, making literary gold. This book is a wonderful gift for students of literary studies, academics, and anyone who loves literature. You could not ask for a better guide to Jungian literary interpretive imagination. That's uh, Luke Hockley. And then finally, um, I think you know, Susan is well known to uh, Leslie Gardner and Luke Hockley, I, I believe, but perhaps less well known to her third um, recommender, which is um, Basara Nicolescu, am I pronouncing that correctly? who's um, well known for his, or becoming well known for his work in transdisciplinary thinking. Um, and he is similarly uh, impressed with Susan's book in the context of that field. This is his endorsement. The most innovative aspect of this book is to consider transdisciplinarity as the most socially liberating framework, both for Jungian studies and interpretation of literary texts. The key point is to take the transdisciplinary symbolic language as the royal way to open new avenues in the study of narratives, myths, and active imagination. The symbolic language implies the interwining of the included middle and the alogical and a-rational hidden third. Many of us here will recognize that as uh, the Jungian transcendent function. The hidden third, which mediates the inter interaction between subject and object, allows describing the unus mundus of oneness and manyness by taking into account both his, what is scientifically known with what is unknown forever. Susan Rowland offers to us a unique Jungian hermeneutics of literature, which rests upon a transdisciplinary foundation. Her book is not only a brilliant essay on Jung, and literary criticism, but also an invaluable textbook for students in literature. So I think we see there in three uh, widely ranging endorsements coming from different perspectives, just how uh, multifaceted and complex, yet accessible and uh, simple in some sense uh, this, this book is. If it teaches us to read again and to see well-known literature with new eyes, that's uh, an amazing achievement. So please join me in uh, congratulating Susan on the publication of her books, and she's now going to give a short presentation based on the ideas covered in it. Susan. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, the check's in the post. I, I want to start by reading the dedication of this book. This book is dedicated to all the students who have endured my efforts to introduce them to Jungian literary criticism, in particular those in the English department of Greenwich University UK and now at Pacifica Graduate Institute, California, USA. May we continue our transdisciplinary adventures. So this book is dedicated to you. All of you have or are having to endure my attempt to introduce you to Jungian literary criticism, whatever the course is actually called. Um, LAUGHTER and you'll notice in this dedication a, a, a mention of two, uh, you know, two types of students, if you like. The English department in, of Greenwich University and Pacifica Graduate Institute. 
So you are graduate students in Jungian depth psychology and archetypal studies. There is another group of graduate students out there doing what is known as literary studies, and ne'er the twain shall meet. Uh, only the twain ought to meet, and, and that's what this book is about. So it's a book that is specifically written for graduate students, specifically you in depth psychology, and they, the other out there in, in literary studies. Um, and, and I think the obvious question is, why should you care? Why should you, doing Jung and archetypal psychology, care particularly about literature? And in a way, the book is about answering that question to you, but it's also about answering the question to, to literary studies. So uh, you know why uh, students in literary studies ought to care about depth psychology. You know why everybody ought to care about depth psychology. Um, but if we ask those students in literary studies, you know, what do you know about Jung? What do you know about the unconscious? How important is the unconscious to your, your study, to your research? Mostly they would say, go away. <laughs> the unconscious is not important to, to our research. I have no interest in depth psychology. It has no relevance to, to the study of literature. And that sounds odd to us. Um, if we then said to, to these, these literature postgraduates, well, I don't really care about literature. It's not what I do in, in depth psychology. It would sound odd to them. So why should you care? Well, because um, very innate to, to what we do care about in Jung and archetypal psychology is the notion of creativity, that the psyche is intrinsically creative, that there are aspects to our psyche that where creativity cannot be, cannot be restricted or, or limited or determined by something else, that the psyche goes beyond that in, in being able to produce new forms and new ideas. So if we really take that seriously about the psyche, then maybe we might care about where we might find that psychic cre creativity displayed. Where, where do we find the psychic creativity of the past? Well, we find it in a lot, a lot of things, but in particular, we find it in art. Um, so we find in, in the works of art, uh, of people who have gone before, there is the evidence of their psychic creativity. So there is a sense that when we're looking at any kind of work, uh, any creative work in any artistic medium, including uh, the literary one of words, that we are looking at a kind of materialized psyche, that we're looking at evidence of the psyche and what the psyche has done when it has been allowed to be more free and more native to itself. So that's one reason. Another reason that we might care about literature and the arts is where was psychology before psychology? Because psychology as something that you could study, psychology as something that was written about, um, is relatively new. There was no psychology before 1700, and yet, People have been human, people have had psyches for thousands and thousands of years. So where was psychology? Why is it that psychology, this discipline that we're all engaged in, wasn't there? And that is an interesting question, um, that, that this particular discipline that you're all studying and doing a, a doctorate in is, is so new that something gave rise to the desire to think about the psyche in this very specific way. Well, where was the, psych where was the psyche before psychology? It was in everything else. It was in religion, it was in the arts, it was anywhere that the psyche was allowed to, be, to, to manifest itself. But there wasn't this thing called psychology per se. And so this, this, we're, 
we're addressing the issue of disciplines and how when we do graduate study, we are working in the context of disciplines. And there are many disciplines. And we are in a discipline that we might call depth psychology. We might call it psychology. And we're particularly studying uh, the work of Jung and uh, the works that comprise archetypal psychology. But we're doing it in the context of a discipline and a sense of, of what psychology is. But it's a young discipline. And if we want to take the discipline seriously, maybe we ought to be looking outside its foundational texts to also learn about the psyche. So what is it that literature has, has to offer um, the, the, the genres of writing that we call psychology? Well, it, it offers a, a consideration of writing that goes back thousands of years. Um, and it offers genres, it offers literary forms that have um, mutated and, and changed and developed over many centuries. It offers categories of uh, knowing. A, a genre is a way of looking at the world, just like an archetype is a way of looking at the world. And it is, it is likely that genres are archetypal. So by looking at genres, we might understand archetypes. By looking at archetypes, we might understand genres. In a, in a very big way, there are kind of big genres and there are little genres. So a big, an example of, of big genres uh, could be well, these, the ancient forms of comedy and tragedy. And we all have a sense of what comedy and tragedy are. Even if you haven't studied it, you have a sense of that because it's, it's become part of our culture. Well, if we look at depth psychology, uh, we could say that Sigmund Freud was a, a, tragic, a tragic writer. For him, life was tragic. Um, it, it was about um, finding the strength to endure the fundamental futility of life in the face of the annihilation of death. Um, bundle of laughs, Freud. Um, so he has a, a, a you know, he has a tragic view, and this is not a controversial thing to say, since he bases so much of his work on an actual tragedy, Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. It is very foundational to Freud's thinking. So, and, and Freud makes no secret of this, that really Freud in psychology comes from a work of literature which is kind of interesting when we think about the relationship between literature and psychology. Now, Jung, I would suggest, is actually a comic writer um, uh, that in two senses. One is there are jokes, <laughs> um, and the jokes are actually very important. They're not decorations. They're actually kind of key. He, he plays tricks. Uh, he makes jokes. But Perhaps more fundamentally, he's a comic writer because his entire outlook is that of the divine comedy. It's about, uh, you know, it's about the wheel of death and rebirth. With Jung, you get the death, you get the dark, you get the, the suffering, but you get the rebirth. Jung is fundamentally optimistic. He's fundamentally about survival. Tragedy is about survival. Um, uh, sorry, tragedy is about the inevitability of death. Comedy is about survival. It's about getting up and carrying on. And, and Jung does it with a flourish because it's, you know, we get to a good place. Individuation is about, you know, getting over the, the, the dark side. So there's, a, there's a, a fundamental comedy about Jung. And, and studying the, the genre of comedy helps us kind of understand this uh, this, this kind of underlying narrative that, that Jung is, is enacting. Where else do we find um, depth psychology before uh, uh, psychology? Well, we, we find it in the margins. And, and to a certain extent, art and literature have been marginalized in our culture. Uh, they are, in some sense, very marginal. They are very marginal now in the 21st century when it is declared that um, they, you know, they are a, um, 
They are a luxury um, that, that cannot be afforded and that, that uh, students in, in schools, in high schools, they should only be studying STEM subjects, STEM standing for science, technology, engineering and maths. So anything to do with the arts and the humanities, this is a luxury. So hence, you know, that we are very much in an era of the marginalization of the arts, which means the marginalization of the creative imagination. And, you know, hence the marginalization of our discipline as well. Um, but however much uh, the, the creative psyche is marginalized, it pops up again, whether it pops up in in paganism, it pops up in magic, it pops up in witchcraft, it, uh, it carries on in alchemy in various forms. So I've been talking about two disciplines here, the discipline of psychology and the discipline of literary studies. And this is emblematic of a fundamental problem that, that we all face. In the 21st century, we face some really big problems um, some of them are staring at us in the, in the face when we turn on the television um, and, and look at, um, you know, the, the political landscape. Some of them are staring at us in the face in every weather forecast. Climate change is a huge, huge problem. And yet we are facing it with our knowledge divided up into chunks. Into these, into these separate disciplines. And some of these disciplines are very new. It's interesting to me that depth psychology and literary studies were born at about the same time, at the end of the 19th century. Um, psychology kind of began a little bit earlier. Psychology of the unconscious really began in the second half of the 19th century. And at about the same time, um, it was not, something terribly shocking happened to universities. And, and this was a terrible, terrible scandal. And, uh, you know, nobody could ever, th you know, universities would never recover. And what was this terrible scandal? They had to admit women. They had to admit women. And they had to admit low class men. And this was terrible because the universities were where the governing elite was educated. And the governing elite was, were obviously going to be men. They were obviously going to be upper-class men. And in America, they were going to be white men. Um, and to be forced to let in these others was a, a terrible shock. And it was clear to the, you know, the, the governors of universities that these new students couldn't possibly do the old curriculum. Uh, they just weren't up to it. Women, it's well known, are not up to serious study. They have wombs, and wombs interrupt serious study. Um, and if, if, if women do do serious study, then their wombs will shrivel up. <laughs> this, was, this was the general view. So clearly something had to be done. And what they did was they invented a discipline that would be soft and um, unimportant enough to be given to, to women in particular. And uh, th so they decided that um, students would be able to study literature in their own language, which had never been done before. Literature had been studied for centuries, but only in Latin and Greek. And um, because Latin and Greek cultures were the preceding cultures that um, uh, Western modernity cared about, and therefore one educated the white male elite to understand these cultures as part as, of, of being the governing elite to come. Nobody in a university would study literature in their own language because literature was a leisure activity and not important. So that's how, in, that's how English literature began as a degree subject, and you can understand from that why it has suffered from what we can recognize as an inferiority complex. That, and it's still there today. That, that, that literature, which was taught by men, 
mostly for, from a very early period, and it's, I think it's still visible today in, in the male scholars in literature, is this, this sense that it's not really manly, that it, it's not tough enough. And so there was this desperate need to theorize literature so that it would become serious. And they also had this idea that they could make it scientific because what was very important um, when literature and depth psychology was born was the idea of science and particularly what was called um, objective science, the science of the subject-object split. This was the top discipline. So everything, you know, if it was going to be proper knowledge, it had to be done under a subject-object split. And we can see that Jung himself was very taken up with this dualism. And so was literature. And so literature was conceived of as a series of objects and would be studied scientifically. And um, the, the reader's imagination would be taken away from it and, and literature would be this object in itself. So that's okay. However, um, there was a growing resistance to the subject-object split in the academic disciplines for very good reasons. Um, one of them being that it kind of doesn't take into account the psyche. Um, and so Jung becomes part of a both uh, an expression of splitting in between subject and object, but also a resistance to it. So the individuation is about getting away from the idea of separateness and uh, uh, embracing the world and uh, seeing oneself as, as in, intrinsically connected to the world. And in a parallel way, literary studies did the same. It began with this idea that, that works of literature, whether they were little poems or big poems or big novels or little stories, they were all objects. And then gradually, theories started to challenge this idea and to see that literature was actually part of a bigger system of culture and also that the reader's psyche was uh, involved in making meaning. But all through the 20th century and into the 21st, we remain afflicted by this notion that somehow objectivity and the split between the researcher and that which uh, one researches, that this is somehow the way it is, or that the, the real knowledge is objective knowledge, that real knowledge is experimental uh, knowledge. Um, so modernity begins with Galileo kind of proposing this scientific model that um, uh, that we need to we need to split off from the object of our knowing, and um, that we need to uh, that knowledge must be rep reproducible. Um, that it's not real knowledge unless it can be reproduced by anybody anywhere in the world. And this has become a cliche and a truism. You know, it's, it's not real knowledge if it can be done by somebody here today at Pacifica or the same kind of um, making of knowledge can be done uh, over the other side of the world or can be done in, in 30 years' time. This is a model of reality as something that is out there, there's something that, that is, is stable, that is rational, that is knowable. It's saying that reality is a kind of machine that we are not part of. And depth psychology has been part of a kind of resistance to this. And um, there are bigger structures of this resistance that depth psychology has, has spoken to. So, for example, the idea of evolution is um, an idea that is not provable by this um, scientific method. And it is, in many ways, the um, recurrence 
of a very ancient myth of the Earth as goddess, um, that we all come from the planet. Related to this is the idea of ecology. Again, something that first appears at the end of the 19th century and is now seen as, as something fundamental to our survival, that we are, everything is connected, um, and, and connected in ways that we, in many ways, we cannot see, we cannot measure, uh, that we, even that we cannot rationally comprehend, but everything is interconnected. And, and the scientific language for understanding this is, is quantum physics, that the, the quantum realm is, talks about a, a connectedness that, that is, is not really accessible to rational understanding. So what this means is that we're kind of stuck in a system that we can no longer believe in, that we can't believe anymore in a hierarchy of knowledge where the subject-object split and the scientific method is the truth about the world and everything else is, is inferior to that. So what is this, so why am I saying these things and the book is called Jungian Literary Criticism? Because this is a practical problem for you all in your research. You, we're trained in, in our separate disciplines. Maybe we're trained in more than one. But we don't want to stay in the separate disciplines because we can see that that's a problem. We want to save the world, and we can't do it entirely by saying in our own little boxes. But the problem with bringing disciplines together is if we take this, my left hand as, as Jung and my right hand as literature, what we typically do when we bring them together is this. We put one discipline on top of the other. And as you can see, I can't really see my right hand because what the discipline, one discipline is obscuring the other. Plus, it's simplifying it. If you apply um, techniques and ideas and um, concepts from one discipline, if you apply it to another discipline, then you are simplifying the first discipline because you are, you are making the concepts more powerful than they ought to be, and you are obscuring the reality of the other discipline. And this is very obvious in Jungian literary criticism, that in the past, Jungians have said, oh, great, literature, um, data, great. And, you know, uh, so, oh, here's a love story. Well, it must be the anima and the animus, you know. And yes, <laughs> but that doesn't actually tell us anything about the novel. You know, just because there's a man and a woman in it and we can say it's the anima and the animus. Well, that's not saying anything very interesting about the novel. And it's not saying anything very interesting about anima and animus, unless you are really creative with that. And, and one simple way of doing this, and I, I did it myself in, the, in my own doctoral work, was I took, okay, let's take Jung and, and put these concepts on, on the novels, but why don't we do the other way around? Let's take the novels and put them on the concepts. What do the novels, if we, if we read the novels as a kind of theory and Jung as a kind of data, what would happen? And some very interesting things happened. Knowledge is always connected to power. Um, and at the moment, we don't feel very powerful because we're in a marginalized knowledge. And the, uh, the power is, is connected to other kinds of knowledge in our society. A society that says STEM subjects are the only important ones is telling us something about how it organizes itself and who it listens to. And it's not listening to the people who are standing up for the creative imagination. So knowledge is connected to power. If we want to save the world, if we want to change the world, if we think there's a problem with the way power operates in the world, we also have to change knowledge. And, and we have to change knowledge from a hierarchy into a network. 
So there's nothing wrong with scientific experiments uh, using the subject-object split, and there's nothing wrong with re reproducible knowledge per se. The problem is when that becomes the only type of knowledge that is, that is uh, valued. So I've kind of been working for 30 years on the problem of this, on the problem of putting one discipline on top of the other. And about five years ago, I discovered transdisciplinarity as described by Basarab Nicolescu. Uh, and he's been publishing on this since the beginning of the 21st century. And he was originally a quantum physicist. And he proposes that we have to think about knowledge in a new way without hierarchy. So to him, transdisciplinarity means no hierarchy of disciplines, no absolute knowledge. There must be mystery. You know, there must, we must not think that we can ever know everything. We must make room for mystery and the irrational that the sacred is an irreducible part of reality because that is one way we keep the mystery in, into it. That the basic structure we should be thinking is not subject-object, but subject-object and hidden third. And Kieran is quite right to call that the transcendent function. I, I say uh, that the, the hidden third is represented by art, that art is the hidden third between, um, between us and the reality that is in part mysterious. Art is the way that we try to deal with the mystery out there. And he suggests that, that academic knowing, meaning the whole collection of disciplines, must embrace the, the other kind of knowing that it's been ignoring for centuries that he calls tradition, um, but we might call by other names, body knowledge, esoteric knowledge, magical knowledge, alchemical knowledge, tacit knowledge, oh, and yoga. <laughs> tradition. The knowledge of tradition works differently from the knowledge of the academy, but it's real knowledge, and, and it needs to be part of, part of the picture. Um, and the symbol... Jung's idea of the symbol is, again, it's, it's what Nicolescu calls the hidden third. It's, it's that which is in sub, within subject and object and takes part of both. This is, this is knowledge in an era of climate change because we can't address, we can't change the way we treat the planet unless we change the way we think about the planet unless we change the power structures that we're trapped in that um, are actually um, mean that we somehow think it's an option whether or not we try to save the planet. Um, so to, to, to try to make a, a more just world, and which means a world that is just to the planet as well as to human beings, we've got to think differently about how knowledge works in separate disciplines. So this book is an attempt to do that. So in, in, one, in, in a very focused way, this is about Jung and literary criticism. And if you don't know much about literary criticism, it introduces it to you. And if you don't know much about Jung, it introduces Jung to you. But it's also about starting to be transdisciplinary and, and starting to see different forms of knowledge as capable of having a positive relationship without attacking each other. You know, we're so competitive that we make our disciplines con competitive. And we, we've done enough of that, you know. The whole business of survival of the fittest, it doesn't work. It isn't how evolution actually happened. It's now become an ideology of capitalism. Um, we've got to stop being capitalist about our disciplines and start being ecological about our disciplines, which means thinking about interconnectivity, thinking about how another discipline helps us understand the mystery of our own disciplines. 
So, just to finish off, this, this, is, this does the big picture of transdisciplinarity, but it also tries to do it in a very um, student-friendly, helpful way. So, um, there are chapters that bring together the obvious ways in which Jung and literary criticism want to talk to each other. So there's a chapter on signs and symbols and, and close reading and, and alchemy. Um, there's a chapter on literary forms, archetypes, individuation and myth. There's a chapter on genre, shadow, anima, animus, self and the numinous. So I'm arguing that things like uh, the numinous is, is related to science fiction. Um, that uh, the, the trickster is related to detective fiction, mystery fiction. Um, anima and animus clearly feed into romance fiction in a number of different ways. Um, but the final chapter is actually available for free on Academia EDU, and it's Jung and Literary Studies for the Anthropocene, Climate Change, and Eco-Criticism. So, you know, how can our, what we care about in, in Jung, how can what we care about in literature and the arts be part of this bigger conversation about climate change and, and, and what we need to, to do about it? Um, each chapter has, a, has at least one case study. Um, so, you know, I take Shakespeare plays, I take um, novels, you know, there's, there's uh, an extended treatment of Jane Eyre, for example, um, and, and poems. Um, there's a glossary uh, of Jungian terms, and as Kieran helpfully said, uh, each chapter has a summary in three sentences, so you can go straight to the three sentences. <laughs> anyway. It's a book written for graduate students. Um, and um, the, the bookstore has very generously offered to be open. Um, so they, the bookstore is now open. If you would like to buy a copy of the book, you can do so. If you'd like me to sign it, I would be delighted to do so. But anyway, don't rush off. We've got to finish the wine. It's obligatory. <laughs> And, you know, we can, uh, you know, carry on and, and talk. I, I am well, I'm going to take any questions that you might have. Uh, my talk has been recorded. We're not recording the Q&A because we might make the talk public and it's, we wouldn't put you uh, in the public domain without your permission. So you're not going to be recorded, but if anyone would like to, to ask a question or make a comment, I would be delighted to hear you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you hugely. Um,